Hello, this is the second uh, return of Café Released uh, after, what was it last time? Oh yeah, Punk is Dead. Now it's time for me, the singularity. And as I said, uh, I'm coming back to Twitch upon the request of good friends. And please meet Michael. Hello, Michael. Could you introduce yourself? Hi there. Thank you for having me. Uh, yes, I am Michael Duxbury. I'm a freelance TTRPG writer, designer, uh, also a self-publisher of uh, small self-published indie story games. Uh, and I'm also the organizer of the UK Tabletop Industry Network, or TIN. Um, and as you say, uh, at the moment for Zine Month, I am crowdfunding uh, for my new story game, Me the Singularity, along with lots of other folks involved with TIN who are also running great uh, Kickstarters and other crowdfunding campaigns at the moment. I believe the next thing is on March 7th. I cannot come, but if people are hearing that in London, they should come. Absolutely, yeah. Tin currently has monthly socials happening in London and in Manchester. Uh, the next one in London, where we are, uh, is indeed on Thursday, March 7th. So please do uh, drop on by and, and look out for our socials to find out where the next one near to you is. Maybe by the time you listen to this, there might be socials happening elsewhere in the UK as well. Yeah, to be accepted, you need to have published three triple A titles, though. No, yeah. It's not true. The, the entry level is really low. You can come without anything, just out of curiosity. And it's really, really welcoming and nice. Thank you. And absolutely. You know, the, it's, it's designed as a meeting place for professionals in the TTRPG space, but also for aspiring professionals in the TTRPG space. So there's no, there's no gatekeeping here to who is and isn't welcome at our events. We want it to be accessible to everyone. So Café Release was born out of uh, the infamous lockdown. And as a result, the ice-breaking question is, what is your routine like? What is your uh, a typical day in the life of Michael or just today? What was it like for you? Or when did you wake up? What did you have for breakfast? <laughs> so uh, this morning, uh, I got to have a little bit of a lie-in because my little, little fluffy ball of a dog, Mochi, um, me and my wife alternate taking him out for his morning walk. So on a good day, I get to uh, have an extra half an hour in bed. On a bad day, I have to take him out to do his business. Um, and then getting up, uh, having a bowl of cereal whilst I start looking at uh, emails or socials, um, especially with the work I'm doing at the moment for the uh, UK Tabletop Industry Network. It's a good to uh, have a look to see what else has come in that I need to uh, have a look at uh, that morning. Um, the day is then spent working on whatever freelance gig or uh, self-published game, or in this case, Kickstarter, uh, is currently on flight. Um, because I do this full time, I never have just one project on the go at a time. There's always, you know, two or three projects running at once, and then one I'm waiting to hear back from an editor, and then one I'm waiting for a contract to come through, and, you know, doing my best to try and balance those as much as I can. Um and, you know, uh, pausing to uh, have lunch with my wife, who also uh, works from home. Um, so that's nice. Um, and then come the evening, uh, when I'm not doing interviews such as this, uh, leaving myself some time to uh, see friends, uh, to have some time off, or to role play. Um, I, I play lots of role playing games. Um, I'm, I'm always in a campaign of uh, something or other, sometimes multiple something or others at once. Um, that's why I do what I do. Um, above all else, I just love to to play and to run role playing games, and and writing and designing and developing role playing games is a passion that's definitely emerged from that, from my experiences of play. You have even a rough idea of many times you refresh the counter on Kickstarter. Uh, I'm just <laughs> you know, having a uh, a benchmark for myself to see uh, if I really do it too much once it's my turn. Oh my gosh, every time I get up away from my computer and then come back to my computer, it's a refresh, which is definitely not the way to do it. There are definitely much healthier attitudes to have than be constantly refreshing, constantly keeping an eye on the on, on the number of backers. Um, but it's human nature, isn't it? You know, it, it, it's very much been like in the back of my mind running right the way through this month. Um, well, let's let's try in... to get those numbers higher. What's your what's your elevator pitch? Sure. So, Me the Singularity is a haunted house in space RPG. Um, it is a uh, about the crew of a deep space research station and the extra dimensional ghost that is haunting them. The crew are trying to understand the 
cryptic messages being communicated by the ghost because they are the only thing that can save them from the looming catastrophe that threatens to destroy them all. And in the game, um, one person will be playing as the ghost. Everyone else will be playing the uh, members of the crew. But the ghost is limited in their ability to communicate with the players. They can only communicate in specific moments um, through uh, gestures, kind of like charades, or uh, fragments of an image, like Pictionary, or fragments of a word, like you're playing Hangman. And over time, you're going to be, uh, the players are discovering more about each other, improving their empathy, improving their ability to communicate with each other, which can unlock new ways for the ghost to communicate. So if the players are playing well together, if they're good at understanding what the ghost is doing, eventually you'll pick up all the vital bits of information that you need to guess correctly at the end of the game in order to save yourselves. And if not, then you get struck by this catastrophe and then you try and play again and hope you can do better next time. I'm fascinated at the moment by the idea of you know role-playing games which are more structured, that have a clear framework and you know sort of foster an experience. You know, you know, there's the the old stereotype. I mean, it's not a stereotype; it's a reality to some extent. Of you play a role playing game and it fizzles away unless it's a one shot. You know, you play a campaign and even a one shot, it, it's sometimes tough to to stick the landing. So the idea of having this framework or thing progressing is is awesome. I find uh, is that the way it works in terms of acts when you have the the hangman, the um, the charade, uh, and so on. So it is split into phases of play. There's like a limited number of days and nights leading up to like the last five days leading up to the catastrophe. Um, and in each of those phases, the ghost has an opportunity to, to interrupt uh, with the haunting uh, once per each uh, one of those moments. And, you know, the reason it works that way is because, I mean, even in a one shot, I find it very difficult to structure a one shot in such a way that you can get to tell a complete story within the time that you've got. And I think having that defined structure really helps, really gives it a bit of context and really drives the story forward. Um, interestingly, uh, in like original versions of the game, it was even more structured with regards to uh, the hauntings of the ghost. It used to be structured such that there would be a day scene, then a haunting scene, then a night scene, then a haunting scene. But we realized um, after the first couple of playtests that the ghost being so constrained and when they could interact meant it was almost as though they were playing a separate game. Um, and I remember the feedback I got from, uh, from my wife, actually, because she played uh, as the ghost in one of our first playtests saying that being separated for so much of the game, you know, it was immersive and atmospheric and isolating and boring. It, you know, it <laughs> felt like she wasn't playing with everyone else. Um, but giving the ghost player the opportunity to choose when they interrupted the action, um, that helped to make it uh, so much more involved. It was an extra way of ghost being able to provide clues to the other players because the moment you time your interruption interruption can be very revealing. And it, it meant that you got to have a bit more theatre uh, to the game as well, which I think is very appealing to a certain kind of player. The fact that you get to do that sort of moment where you, you, you leap to your feet or you flick the lights on and off or however it is that you want to indicate uh, that the regular sequence of play has been interrupted and now it's the ghost's time to shine. So, we've got, yes. We've got Comrade Bubbles in the chat room uh, who, who chimes in saying that defined structure also might help out first time game masters. Yeah, it definitely are. Uh, game First time game master or even first time players. I mean, it's it's reassuring in a way to have the, the structure. It's a, I think it's a bit fascinating also how, personally, I'm a a bit of a defender of railroading. Uh, mm. I go a bit against the grain, but I think with frameworks like that, you get the best of both worlds. You got a structure, so you're reassured regarding the progression of the overall narrative. Uh, but within that, you can give a lot of freedom to everyone to come up with, with things because uh, the structure is it's legible, it's uh, it's explicit. So then people can can build on that somewhat easily. Yeah, I agree that people find it easier to, uh, you know, it, it, it's difficult to improvise in a vacuum. Having some constraints to kind of bounce off of, I think is very important. Me, the Singularity, as it happens, doesn't use a GM, but it's one of those games where really everyone is the 
uh, GM to an extent because responsibility for like setting up the scene is something that kind of like rotates between mm. the players. So everyone has that moment where they're going to be uh, put on the spot a bit and have to decide the context of what the next scene is. And we're going to provide loads of guidelines in the game. Current version of the game so there's like a list of prompts you can use to start that scene off um, to make sure that people feel like they're equipped to be able to run that. Uh, Comrade Bubbles, by the way, is actually uh, Ryan Wielden, uh, who is going to be editing the game. Ah. Um, so, hello, Ryan. It's really great to have you here. Um, and it's really great to have them involved as an editor as well. Having a, I mean, it makes a huge difference, I find, having an editor. Uh, mine is Chris as Sims. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you had this experience, Michael, but personally, even when I was writing the game, especially the second one, mm. uh, I mean, I had, Chris was not hired yet, but I was pretty confident I, I, I should be on board again. But I find it comforting and encouraging for me to write. You know, I didn't stress as much as getting things absolutely right. I could concentrate on being creative and getting the information on the page, knowing that uh, if it doesn't make sense, someone <laughs> was behind and would help me uh, make sense out of what I was trying to say. What what a wonderful way! What a wonderful thing to say to get your editors to kill you. Yeah, it's, uh, no, I, do, I do know what you mean. Uh, I, I'm sure it is infuriating for an editor to hear. No, we still want you to you know create the best thing that, that you the, the most honed text that you can. But of of course it is reassuring. Of course it is is uh, a, a huge relief to know that whatever I I try and put together, even if I don't get all the way to 100, percent I'm going to have an experienced, trained uh, editor in the form of uh, Ryan to take me over to the top and uh, hone the text in something that I couldn't do on my own, even if I was bringing my 100% A game. Uh, so yeah, it's fantastic to have them on board for the project. So there's something about me, the singularity, which I, I did not realize. I mean, it was a bit foreshadowed for me because I was like, hang on a minute, that mm -hmm. visual style, that, that rings a bell. I was not uh, familiar with uh, the, the work behind it, but uh, Michael, are you still really indie? You're doing licensed games now? <laughs> yes, technically, it is a, a licensed RPG uh, in that it is an adaptation of a visual novel uh, by Super Circuit, who I'm also really thrilled is on board uh, to be the uh, graphic designer and illustrator and designer uh, for the zine as well. Um, she is an uh, indie uh, video game uh, producer. Media Singularity is something that stemmed from uh, a visual novel uh, jam that was hosted on itch.io. Uh, she's also a personal friend. And I knew looking at the work that she was doing, that she was doing something that was going to be, uh, that she produces beautiful games and, and with themes that really resonated with me is something that would adapt really well into a TTRPG. So I was able to approach her about working on this and that was great. And I was thrilled that not only was she happy for me to go ahead but she was enthusiastic uh, for me to be involved and uh yes uh, though it is is technically an adaptation and though i think that means i have to hand in my my indie badge because I, I've, I've sold out to to you know big corpo interests I, I i think super circuit is very much embodying the same spirit as me of we're both small time uh creators uh, excited for the opportunity to work on a small team and, and try and produce something that can extend it beyond the small audiences that we currently have, C combining the small audiences we have into, you know, a, a small to mid-sized audience. It's called, it's called commercial <laughs> synergy. That's a sort of... Exactly. Yeah, in, yeah, yeah. Uh, MBA <laughs> studies. Uh, did, huh? did you add the idea or the desire for the game and then you ran into... Uh, the, the visual novel or did you see the visual novel that inspired the game and then you reach out to super circuit did super circuit came and like let's build this multimedia empire together what, what was sort of the sequence <laughs> of events it was the, it was the middle option uh it was not an idea that i had for a game until i had played me the singularity myself and I uh, immediately saw in playing that game an opportunity for us to uh, do something together. And at that point, I approached Super Circuit about doing the game. The uh, I did a very cheeky thing, which was I didn't approach her until I'd already started working on it. 
Uh, so I could then go to her and be like, oh, I'm currently writing this game, which I'm having a lot of fun doing. It's based on a really cool visual novel that I played recently. So she could then be like, oh, what's the game? And I'm like, oh, the game is me, the singularity. And then she, you know, was delighted and thrilled, which is lovely. And uh, the fact that I was able to surprise her was nice. And the fact that she was uh, keen to be involved surprised me. So it was very much a... Uh, I uh, chanced my arm by going ahead and hoping that I'd have something cool to show her and that would encourage her to be involved. And it paid off because she was excited with what I've produced so far. And, and uh, uh, the fact that, you know, she's come and she's doing more uh, illustration and that she helped set up the Kickstarter with, with a bunch of the assets that we're using. Yeah, it, it's, it's been a, she, she's a dream partner. It's been a dream country to work on this project. Uh, yeah, Magpie L has got the, the best description of tin and uh, the most accurate description of tin I've ever seen. Uh, uh, they say UK tin is a Katamari Damacy of indie creators. Yeah, we are just this <laughs> big ball of uh, rolling down the hill. <laughs> we keep having people join being surprised by the other people they know who are already here. And it's like, yeah, I mean, we'll roll up everyone eventually, you know, ju just like Katamari Damacy. Eventually, it's going to be rolling up buildings and then moons and then planets. It's going to get completely out of hand. <laughs> so uh, back to the campaign. Uh, you got a stretch goal coming. I think it's the director's cut uh, stretch goal. Uh, can you tell us a, a bit about this stretch goal and maybe the, the ones that follow? Absolutely. So we've just got uh, three uh, stretch goals at the moment, which we've uh, not hit, but we're hoping that in the next few days we will. The first one, as uh, you said, is a director's commentary for me and Super Circuit to play through the visual novel together. And as we're doing so, that's going to be an opportunity to talk about the process uh, that went into the creation of the visual novel, which obviously Super Circuit will be able to reveal a lot about. And then my process in adapting that into the TTRPG. Uh, what themes, what characters, what elements of the story I felt were pivotal to make the translation across and how I made that work within a TTRPG format. I really enjoy reading designers' notes and watching directors' commentaries on, on movies and, and games and similar. So I'm really looking forward to doing that. I hope other people are as excited as I am to be able to uh, learn about all that kind of, of uh, behind-the-scenes detail. I hope someone finds it useful. Our second stretch goal is for uh, increasing the amount that we pay Ryan, our editor. Uh, me and Super Circuit are splitting all the proceeds that we make for the project 50-50 uh, right down the middle. Ryan in editing is, is coming on specifically for that job. So we want to make sure that if the campaign does really well, that they are able to benefit uh, and, and uh, share in that success as well. I always really enjoy it when other people's Kickstarters have additional uh, payouts as a stretch goal. So I hope people appreciate us having it here as well. And at 2,500, we're going to actually do an extra PDF, uh, a law Bible, which Super Circuit is going to write for the setting of the Media Singularity visual novel and optionally for your TTRPGs as well. Uh, it's also the setting of some of the other visual novels that, uh, that Super Circuit has done, which you can find uh, on her itch.io uh, page. It, it was a, a difficult thing to balance how much of the uh, lore of the game we wanted to include in the core text. Um, because on, on one hand, there's lots of uh, things that are in the game that I think are really nice to be able to transition across. On the other hand, it's a game that's very much designed for like snap pickup play. Um, so we didn't necessarily want there to be a, a lot of law that was a requirement in order for people to play or that we included too much and it was perceived that it was a requirement in order to play. So this seemed like the perfect compromise. You know, if we get enough funding to to justify the time that gets into creating it, um, I know it's something that Super Circuit would love to do. And then people who want to explore the world more have the opportunity to do so. Um, and people who are quite happy inventing uh, details of the world for their own games. They can do that as well. And it's a fun little extra that they didn't pay anything extra for, uh, for them to enjoy in their own time as well. So those are the stretch goals that we've got so far. So Secret's going to do the graphic design as well of the, the book? That's right, yeah. Super Circuit is going to be doing uh, layouts. And you can see a mock-up of uh, what we're uh, currently thinking that's going to look like uh, that we uh, did in preparation on the Kickstarter page. Uh, I know that she's been, uh, she's really excited uh, to do uh, more uh, graphic design work and, and to play around with the uh, text that I'm working on at the moment. 
And I know that she's also been uh, benefiting from the fact that one of our most recent talks that we had in the UK10 Discord uh, is by uh, Virginia Garcia McShannock, who is a very experienced uh, graphic designer and, and, and layer artist uh, artist in the TTRPG space. She's done some great work with companies like Modifius and Soul Muppet and, and uh, uh, DMG uh, Supplements and others. And that was a fantastic talk. And I, I know that Super Circuit was there uh, with a metaphorical notebook trying to uh, absorb as much knowledge uh, as we could to make sure that we're reflecting that in the finished product that we get out to backers to make sure that it's something as as uh, professionally produced and as beautiful as people rightfully expect for what they're backing with their with their pledges. The finished product, what sort of your... Well, of course, we know delivering fulfillment is the, the big challenge of Kickstarter once it's funded. Uh, yeah. what, what sort of your your target in terms of delivering? Is it Expo 2025, Dragon Me 2024. <laughs> we'd love, you know, the, the the date that we've been quoting on the uh, Kickstarter is November of this year. Uh, mm -hmm. Luckily, it's a uh, relatively small uh, project. We're producing a zine rather than a full book. Uh, the text is not finished. But there's a, a bit more uh, playtesting that we want to do uh, in order to get it 100% ready. But it's not starting from scratch. Uh, if you back the Kickstarter now, you'll be able to see in the first update the text as it currently stands. We're not anticipating massive changes to the mechanics. Most of what we think we want to do uh, with the text is tweaks like uh, extra examples. I don't know. Your, your editor in the chat room seems to think that they're going to have to change a lot of things. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what they're hired for. Um, yes, it, it's, good. it's definitely a, a rough... Uh, raw text uh, version of the game, not got yet gone through the editing path, uh, not yet uh, been adjusted to fit uh, the layout that we have. Um, we're hoping that we can uh, get that out to people for November, so then we can bring uh, physical copies uh, along to Dragon Meat at the end of this year uh, and start getting that into the hands of people who weren't able to back the Kickstarter for whatever reason. So that's the target. So I'm going to curse it and say, no, not on purpose, but <laughs> sounds like uh, people have got funding, uh, participating in the Kickstarter will see pictures on social media of other people with physical copies at Dragon Meat while it's <laughs> shipping to them. Guaranteed to infuriate them. No, that, that's one of the reasons. I'm not, I'm not, so I'm not cursing, I'm exorcising here. I'm doing yeah. the opposite. I'm yes, saying no, just no, the opposite. It can't happen. <laughs> No, we will definitely be trying to make sure that everyone gets their coffee well before uh, Dragon Meat, so that when we are giving out physical copies there, uh, it won't be before any of the people who backed the uh, Kickstarter. Goodness. <laughs> so I believe this is your, your first Kickstarter campaign uh, at the Elm, and not alone, because you've you got a graphic designer who's also a, a visual... Uh, uh, got my terms now. Uh, visual novel... Uh, author and so on. You got an editor on the starting blog, but yeah, it's, I believe it's the first one you you know under your name on Kickstarter. Uh, are there things you discovered that you you did not expect, despite you know all the meetings we have with Tin, where a lot of people give good advice. Once you're there, you, you still got a few surprises, I would assume. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you're right that I have benefited from the knowledge of folks in Tin in making this happen. I mentioned already that uh, Virginia did a tin talk for us uh, last month or, or earlier this month. Um, the one before that was a fantastic talk that Matt Sanders from Burma and Deckard did about crowdfunding. And I was I, I was the one in that case uh, making all the notes to make sure we were as prepared for this as possible. And, and you know, we've also benefited from uh, loads of people, uh, loads of my friends offering me advice who have a lot more experience doing this than me, which I'm hugely grateful. Um, but yes, absolutely. There, there is no substitute for actually doing it yourself. That's one of the reasons that I, I was so keen to get this done, even if it was a relatively small project and I wasn't necessarily expecting it to be a big money maker. I knew it was important for me to uh, give it a go and try it myself because there is no substitute for being the person actually project managing the, the crowdfunding campaign. So yes, just getting to see what the back end of Kickstarter looks like is something that I'd never done before. Uh, suddenly realizing how many steps there were to, to, to launching the campaign and all the different tools that you could use in order to find out additional information. Um, and that's before we get onto any of the more complicated stuff. We, you know, we've not yet got to fulfillment and, and, and delivery and, and uh, 
um, this wasn't a campaign on the scale where we were using lots of advertising. So I, I'm aware even this first small project is only giving me a taste of like the broader Kickstarter ecosystem. Um, but I'm excited to discover more. And I'm very grateful that uh, people have uh, backed the campaign in the numbers that they have, um, even though I am a, a first time uh, user of Kickstarter. Um, I think it's something that Zine Month um, does really well. It is uh, expectations for uh, games that get produced as, as part of that are, are um, I wouldn't say that people's expectations are low, but people understand that the point of this uh, particular month is is to give first timers and less experienced creators opportunities to try the platform for the first time. Um, and it's in that spirit, I think, that, that people have been backing me. And I hope I don't let them down. I, I hope I'm able to, um, first of all, you know, avoid any of the major pitfalls that I know often can befall uh, crowdfunding campaigns. Uh, and second of all, learn from the experience because uh, I've already learned a lot, and I'm sure I'll be learning more. So what what I've heard about, you know, uh, when you check someone doing a Kickstarter, uh, especially if, if they're first, it's having a quick look at how many campaigns they support themselves. And not only you <laughs> supported a lot of Kickstarter campaigns from a, a lot of folks, but even as part of your campaign, I saw you make you you take advantage of. Uh, you know, your updates to promote project by others. Uh, is it something you've seen other doing or is it, or, or did you came up with that idea? So again, I, I, I was uh, very lucky to be uh, getting advice uh, from a bunch of folks uh, for how it was that I could try and, you know, get out of my uh, echo chamber, uh, out of my bubble, give other uh, people an opportunity to look at uh, the campaign um and the idea of doing these uh promo swaps is something uh i talked to uh, my good friend flavio at uh, grumpy bear stuff um about who was just today uh been uh talking about me the singularity and some of grumpy bear stuff's uh kickstarter campaigns so should again, be busier was, working on paris gondo is a bit <laughs> behind with that <laughs> it, it it's you know the, the fact that we have tin is a place for uh especially other creators who are also doing zine month so I was able to promote their stuff on their campaign and, and vice versa, um, I think is a, a, a natural opportunity for us to pair up and help each other. And again, it feels in the spirit of Zine Month, right? It feels in the spirit of the season that um, this is a chance for not only uh, supporting first-time creators, but for discovering other uh, first-time creators that you might not otherwise be aware of. Um, so just some of the examples of, of ones that have been in some of my updates, um, you know, uh, some of them have, have now uh, funded, which is fantastic, uh, and, and, and their campaigns are over, like uh, Conviction by uh, WH Arthur or Death Game by Laurie O'Connell. Um, but some campaigns are still going and you should absolutely uh, back them. For example, uh, uh, Fishbone Archipelago Lost Lighthouse uh, by Mikhail Malkin uh, is not quite yet to its funding goal. So... Uh, any support there would be uh, fantastic. Um, there's other campaigns from the likes of the Arcanist's Tavern, uh, which is a new uh, board game and uh, RPG wargaming cafe opening in Shoreditch, which oh. is beautiful. Um, yeah, it, it's one that I hope we're going to use as the venue for future tin events because it looks like it, it, it it's set up as like a, an immersive gaming cafe. They're like mocking it up as like a fantasy tavern. It looks like it's going to be incredible. I can't wait for that to uh, that to open up uh, in March. Um, and then Outliers uh, by uh, uh, Sam Lee and the folks at the uh, uh, Far Horizons co-op, uh, also currently kickstarting. Uh, Legend in the Mist uh, is still ongoing. I think Ritual Magic for Besties by uh, uh, Kayla Dice, I think is still going on Crowdfunder and many, many others, more than I can and rant about here. So uh, if nothing else, go to my Kickstarter to check out the updates so you can find those other Kickstarters. Because even if you don't like me, the Singularity, I'm sure you'll like them instead. <laughs> so it's going to be too soon for me, the Singularity, unless uh, you, you pull something truly uh, astounding. But uh, UK Games Expo is getting dangerously close for people who intend on selling something there, uh, something that might not be quite ready. Um, just saying that for no reason, but 
<laughs> what uh, are you well i assume you'll be there uh what will you have uh at your booth to to sell to people uh, as uh you will be in parallel working on me the singularity hmm yeah it's less than a hundred days to go to uk games expo how absolutely terrifying <laughs> is that yeah um yes uh uk tim will be there we have big plans actually uh for our stall uh, at uk games expo we're going to be joining forces uh with hive mind games amongst others uh to try and produce a, a, a larger stall than usual um which we think is going to be one of the must see attractions of the uh, convention uh but i shouldn't say too much uh, about it this time uh, i'm sure we'll be shouting uh, about it over the months to come to encourage people to come and check us out. Uh, I will be there uh, with my zines on the stall. The zines that I'm going to be selling there are all ones that are actually currently available in the Me the Singularity uh, Kickstarter campaign as well. So to quickly run through those, uh, I've got two games in my uh, Dark Aesop series, uh, Crying Wolf, which is a uh, kids versus the horror, violent survival horror game. Um, there are some kids up on the hill looking after a flock. There is a monster that stalks them. Obviously, the adults don't believe them, so they have to try and find a way to defend themselves. Uh, golden Eggs is inspired by the fable of the goose that laid the golden egg and how uh, the most productive and uh, uh, creative members of uh, an organization are exploited by their employers. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Pro pro processing some experiences uh, of uh, earlier employment history with that one. So um, hang on, I is that, can you play in different settings? Like, can I play uh, an idol, for instance? Uh... Yes, absolutely. The, oh, the wow. setting, yeah, the setting of uh, Golden Eggs is, is left uh, uh, neutral. It's something you define as part of uh, character, uh, or like game setup whilst people are doing characters is what is the farm at which you're working? And it can be something as as uh, literal as an actual farm or interpreted as, you know, the, the global entertainment business and the way in which it uh, chews up uh, creators within that space. Um, and absolutely, you can make it work within that kind of context. It, it, the, it, my it, highlight of 2023 was, uh, well, highlight, I mean, uh, in terms of consumer, was watching uh, Oshinoko. So I recommend people out there to check <laughs> out that show, which which goes in places. But yeah, it's centered around a, an idol. So yeah, uh, I'd be in the mood for some idol team. Uh, <laughs> then you might... You might enjoy Golden Eggs. It, it's a team RPG, Golden Eggs, because it starts off with just um, one player uh, playing the farm and everyone else being the fowl um, that are beneath them. Um, but over the course of the game, you can get to stages um, where there is the potential for player elimination um, because uh, the farm is for forced to burn through its resources oh, in order wow. to achieve its aims. And then the fowl have a choice in that moment, whether or not they're going to burn out, in which case they are eliminated from the game, or sell out, in which case they join the farm. And then at that point, all the information that the other players have trusted them with, that now becomes available to the farm as well. So the best way to play is for all the players to be working together, but you're never entirely sure if you can trust the other players, um, because at any time they might sell out and go join the other team and take everything that you've sold them with them. Um, yeah, we're we're processing some stuff with Golden Eggs, uh, and I, I hope that uh, that that's one that uh, people take the opportunity to pick up whilst they're picking up Singularity. And then very quickly, the other two games that uh, I'm also going to have at UK Games Expo, you can also get the Kickstarter. Um, Field Trip uh, is a, a family-friendly adventure uh, about uh, a bunch of group of ma rascally school children foiling a museum heist. It's a little bit Home Alone. It's a little bit nice at the museum. Uh, I joke that it's my penance for all the horrible things that are children in Crying Wolf. Um, and then there's Lady Beast, uh, which is a romantic fantasy RPG inspired by 80s fantasy movies, especially the movie Lady Hawk, uh, which is a movie very dear uh, to my heart and, and, and uh, to me and my wife. Um, it's about a couple, uh, one of whom transforms into an animal during the daytime, one of whom can transforms into an animal at night they're trying to break the curse that keeps them separated so that they can be together um and as i say all of those games will be at uk games expo but you can also get them as part of the media singer kickstarter 
So that's quite a lot of titles. Why me, the singularity, is the first on Kickstarter rather than Golden Egg or Cry Wolf? Love the title Cry, Cry Wolf, by the way. That's uh, that's Thank a nice you. catch. <laughs> yeah, so I do have plans uh, for what I want to do with some of my other games because they were all kind of like produced as like ash can zines. My, my first time ever self publishing. Well, firstly, they were the first thing that I self published digitally, and then the first thing that I self published physically to take with me to conventions. Um, you know, s some of the plans that I have for what I want to do uh, with those games, uh, I probably shouldn't talk too much about because I'm hoping to talk to uh, publishers about uh, making them a reality. Um, but to give one example, I would love to uh, finish my Dark Aesop trilogy. Uh, I would love to do a third game to accompany uh, Crying Wolf and to accompany uh, Golden Eggs. And then potentially that would be something that could be packaged together in a single product. Um, and the reason that that's not on Kickstarter yet is I haven't written the third game yet. Um, it was definitely uh, the opportunity to do Me the Singularity fell into my lap and it kind of skipped to the head of the queue. It certainly didn't hurt. There was a bunch of assets that already existed from the game that I was able to use in like the, the promotion of the Kickstarter, which especially when you decide to do your Kickstarter at the last minute, which I foolishly did, oh, wow. uh, was, was a, a huge bonus. Yeah, it was only something I decided to do this year, which is, you know, not how to do a Kickstarter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah not for Zine Quest. I mean, you can yeah. decide this year to do something in October or November. But... Yes, that's a much more sensible way of doing it than what I did. So don't try this at home, kids. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that some of those games are, are ones that I will eventually be bringing to Kickstarter uh, in, a, in a slightly different form. Um, and that the lessons I've learned from doing the Mises and Glarity means that I can make, for example, the Dark Aesop trilogy in, into a uh, 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 more successful product, more successful crowdfunding campaign, uh, making sure that I'm giving all three of those games uh, as good a first foot forward as I can. So we mentioned convention, and I think you're f my first guest who went as a you know indie publisher or any type of publisher for role playing game went to MCM Comic Con, uh, mm -hmm. and you told me already about that experience uh, and the gossips about that. Well, we, no gossip tonight. For the gossip, you need to come to UK Tin uh, in <laughs> Manchester. But yeah, uh, can you? Tell us a bit about your experience there. Is it something first that you think you're going to uh, replicate uh, this year with other publishers? For sure. So I, I, I've spoken to a few people about MCM Comic Con in London, and I think they've had a similar response to me the first time I heard about doing it last year, which was, oh, yeah, I think I went to that like seven or eight years ago. I don't remember them having much tabletop stuff. Do they have much tabletop stuff? Um, and the answer is yes, a bit. Uh, but it's something that seems to be growing over time. Uh, the first one I went uh, in several years was in the first half of last year uh, when Dicebreaker did an industry event at MCM. Uh, that was a really great event. They're doing it again uh, for uh, May's London Comic Con happening in a couple of months' time. I'd really recommend uh, folks who are listening to uh, apply and to attend that if you're in or near London. That was a really great opportunity to network with other folks and let people know about tin but it was also a great opportunity to wander around the con and see what else was happening from a tabletop perspective which is the point at which we thought okay maybe we should give tabling a go um we then did go back in october our first time tabling at mcm and for us it went really well uh, we managed to uh, have the the biggest convention that tin had had to date we, we sold a lot of products um we do want to go back uh, to MCM um, because it was such a successful event for us. But there definitely is the fear that we're not entirely sure what it was that accounted for that success because mm -hmm. there was a lot of factors that kind of aligned uh, on that particular event in uh, October last year because Critical Role were in the UK, um, the cast of uh, Baldur's Gate 3 uh, were also there, uh, the uh, Oxventure guys, actual players, were, were also present. They, they were all at the convention. And uh, these are big names in the tabletop space, Critical Role especially. And, you know, that's not something that you can count on every time. So we're going to be there for the Dicebreaker industry events. That's, that's me and Tim. We'll be there for the Dicebreaker industry events in May of this year. Uh, we're not going to be tabling uh, in May of this year just because 
it, it because it's a riskier proposition because it's not a tabletop event and because there's extra preparation that needs to be done in advance we've decided to throw our efforts into uk games expo instead because the may one is the weekend before uk games expo and doing those in back-to-back -back weekends it's kind of a tall order um but mcm comic-con is twice a year in london so there's another one in i think october again and our current plan you know touch wood is that we will be there um, with another really great table and that we're going to try and uh, make that event as much of a barnstorming success as the last one was for us. And, you know, if you're into tabletop games and you're going to be at the convention, please do stop by the stall. Uh, in turn over in the chat says, so just call the critters back over so you do good business again, obviously. I wouldn't say it's so obvious. Uh, <laughs> it, I mean... Uh, I, I recorded an episode at MCM Comic Con, and uh, yeah, you, I had I had press access, but that doesn't mean I had full access to all the guests. So I didn't have an opportunity really to sit down with the cast of Critical Role. Uh, mm -hmm. I could ask a couple of questions to interesting people who are, you know, voiceover actors and stuff like that as part of press uh, mini, not seminars, but yeah, meet and greet. I guess is the term, uh, but. Uh, if you check those episodes, which are a few years old now, it was the first time ever Critical Role was coming in Europe. I interviewed a lot of critters, and uh, I like asking the question, what do you play beside D&D? &D? And not a lot of them had an answer to that. So I think there's <laughs> definitely, it's very interesting, MCM Comic Con and events like that, to reach out to a different audience, especially in an age where uh, social media is collapsing like, completely. Mm. So I think in person events like that will get even more of a you know a drive than than they they use uh, maybe a come back to that but yeah i think you need some very a specific pitch and type of games to to attract uh that specific audience because they 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 high they have, they have a weird combination of uh, it's not a criticism uh, high expectations uh, I think if you reach out to them, you manage to to resonate with their taste. Uh, they they will give back a lot to you in terms of support and enthusiasm. But uh, yeah, I yeah, there's a lot of very good role playing game, well produced role playing game. Uh, you show up to them, and I, I don't think you will it will resonate with them. Uh, I agree enough. with that. And, and and certainly they're coming at it from a different perspective and you have to tailor uh, the products that you have and the way in which you sell them to the audience that you're speaking to. You know, we're lucky on the UK tin uh, stall in that we have an amazing variety of content. So yes, we've got some uh, fantastic uh, standalone, high concept, one-shot friendly RPGs. Um, but we also have stuff that will fit just fantastic into whatever D and D game you're already doing. You know, whether that's uh, some of the uh, amazing battle maps and, and character sketches uh, by Mikhail Malkin, or uh, you know, these uh, scented D twenty candles uh, that are really yeah, great. Yeah, actually, you uh, don't bother. Stop it. writing. Just bring candles and so we yeah. <laughs> we'll sort it with them. I mean, we have adventures too, and and I, I also think you know. Yes, it's true that some uh, folks from Critical Role or, or from uh, the broader uh, non-RPG space, but maybe folks who have experience with video game RPGs, their only real experience is something like D&D &D or something D&D uh, &D adjacent or, or, or uh, similar to D&D. &D. You know, I agree with you that it's so important to be out there and meeting people in person. And one of the reasons it's so important is you can be the first opportunity for that person to see a different kind of game. And those are some of my most rewarding interactions when I'm at a convention. Um, when someone says, oh, I'd like to role play, but I just can't find time to get my group together. And then you get to say, great, we have a dozen solo journaling RPGs <laughs> on this stall, which I think would be, it, which it perfectly solves that problem. And then their reaction is, I didn't even know that was a thing. I didn't even know that existed. And, and you're able to introduce them to this whole new world. And at the extreme, you've got people who don't even know D&D, people who've never interacted with RPGs before at all. And any time someone comes to our stall and the first ever RPG that they've seen isn't D&D, it's one of our games. <laughs> that, that's a huge win for me. I, I think that's fantastic. Even if they don't buy anything, if, if this is their first impression of what the hobby is like, I think that's brilliant. And I love that. I think it's... Uh... 
I mean, I get it that uh, a lot of people don't like that, but uh, to some extent, I, you know, I, I did Expo, I did Dragon Meat, uh, especially the Expo last year was intense as I was promoting the, the early, very early stages of the Kickstarter while selling the last physical copies out of Paris Gondo, The Life-Saving Magic of Inventoring. Uh, there's 48 copies left at Indie Press Revolution. Please go buy them. But uh, it, it's, it's kind of like, I don't know, judo that you you see people passing along your store and if you are you are really driven to to make a sale and you know not just for financial reason because you're you're sincere in the way you want to engage with a vast array of audience it, it's an interesting practice that uh, first of all are people coming towards your booth or just passing by you observe them okay oh they got a critical role badge or oh they got a t-shirt uh about something japanese and yeah in my case it was like okay japanese t-shirt hey you you love marie kondo you like marie kondo you don't you and you start from <laughs> there and it's funny even to to turn around sometimes people who come who come and they they look very skeptical and uh, yeah you're very proud when you manage to oh, i don't like this type of game well this is not this type of game. <laughs> this is another type <laughs> of game, and uh, and yeah, you managed to to pull things off. Like my first sale at the Expo last year, uh, and I did not realize who it was. Uh, uh, I started doing my pitch and explaining, yeah, and in the box you got stone. And the, this is just the thing that resonated with that person was like, what you you selling me literally a box full of stones? are you kidding me <laughs> it's like this is brilliant i'm buying it uh i said i wouldn't buy too many games here because i need to fly back to the u.s but uh it doesn't matter uh and i was like you know you can remove the stone and pick new stones if you want <laughs> uh, and uh yeah, yeah. And you, that was you absolutely sorry, God. <laughs> yeah, no, no, and yeah, no. In the end, it was. I think his name is Tim Hutchings. Uh, was really nice. And he's the author of uh, a thousand-year-old yeah, vampire. vampire. So I was like, wow, that's that's so encouraging. <laughs> I mean, T Tim is a massive troll because yes, <laughs> I think he, he he did the limited edition version of a thousand-year vampire that didn't have any words in there. So I, I I am sure that if you just sold him literally a box full of stones with nothing else in it, he would have lapped that up. So uh, yes, congratulations. <laughs> do you do you have such an experience in the, an MCM or you know? With someone somewhat skeptical coming to you and managing to find the thing to sell besides that that person who didn't have time to, to put together a group that's an interesting question I'm, I'm trying to think of examples of when we were able to make sales when i really thought we weren't wouldn't be able to i mean i i do think there are some examples of um people who were really only interested in D, &D content and we a lot of what we had wasn't that but luckily we did have some things um, Mik Mikhail Malkin does a, a brilliant uh, series of, of like uh, a, a deck of NPC uh, NPCs that you can interact with. That's very to good enter. to sell. Yeah, them. yeah, yeah. Uh, it's called Ash Noctum's Traveling Companions, and you, you know, just the fact it's fifty-two names that you can draw <laughs> is, I think, a huge win by itself. But the fact that you all have like a connecting story and accompanying art, I think, really uh, resonates with people. Um, I'm trying to think of other examples of when we were able to uh, make sales that weren't expected. Um, it, it helps I think also. Correspondence. I think it helps I think also for correspondence. Oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> I think it helps also for this type of audience to have uh, things which uh, are not too expensive because you you mm. it's more likely you have a, an impulse purchase, which is more difficult to have with something you know which is more pricey. Exactly. Um, and, and, you know, most of what we have is zines, so I think it's easier for people to justify making that impulse purchase, especially when people come to something like Comic-Con, when, you know, they're, they're hope, they were hoping to go down Artist Alley and, and support a, a small-time comic artist by picking up a single issue of something. It's and like, how much is that zine? Five pounds. I pay that, so you stop talking to me? No problem. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that certainly helps. <laughs> the other example I was going to say just then of, of instances of, of something that really resonated with uh, people was correspondence RPGs, duet mm. games. Um, they're such... They're an acquired taste to play games that they're never our best sellers. 
but you will get a few people coming who are specifically looking for two player games. And at MCM, we had two. We had two great correspondence games. Um, we had Talking Thunder uh, by Eleanor Hingley, uh, which is a game about two people who are uh, communicating with each other uh, in like a dystopian uh, regime where their uh, messages to one another are what is giving them the, the hope, the inspiration to keep going. You have to be careful about what you're communicating to each other because your communiques might be intercepted oh, by totalitarian authority. That. And you know, that's an extra level of, of, of uh, complication. Um, and then there was an amazing game uh, called Signal to Noise by Craig Duffy, uh, which is another two-player game. Uh, this one played uh, by email, uh, digital correspondence, because the idea is that one of you is like an astronaut going out into space. One of you is based back on a planet and you're trying to stay in touch with one another. But over time, the gaps between correspondence as you're getting further away from each other becomes larger. The time dilation becomes a thing. So it all becomes a bit interstellar. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think, like I say, two-player games, that they tailor to a very specific audience. But obviously, it's an audience that are very passionate about those kind of games because they're such intimate personal experiences. In a way more intimate and personal than solo games even though it, it is a solo game is something that is directly personal because it's only enjoyed by one person but you know i feel like you need at least one other person in order to appreciate the the uh the, the sensitivity uh, and uh personality uh, of what you're experiencing um that's a you know obviously great game for couples or for uh uh best friends or long distance uh uh pen pals uh, or similar they were both great games. Um, Lady Beast, the game I spoke earlier, can also play with two or more. Um, you can play that uh, with just you and a significant other. I, I, I think those are ones that I thought we wouldn't be able to pitch anything to anyone, but because we had those two player games, that can sometimes make all the difference. Yeah, that's a, the double edge of doing something niche. On one hand, you know, mm. it's a hard sell to a vast number of people but when you find again the people it resonate with you you will resonate very hard and that's where uh you get in an order similar yeah the uk indie league makes sense because you you, you have a, an array of things on offer so yeah hopefully uh people show up and uh within the catalog there's something that that will work for them yeah, and the gamble doesn't always pay off, um, as well as doing self-published works. Um, I also do uh, freelance work for the likes of um, uh, the Warhammer RPGs for Cubicle 7 or the Star Trek RPG for uh, Modiphius. I did a uh, assignment with uh, Palgrim Press uh, a year or two ago now. Um, they uh, produce games like... Uh, uh, Trail of Cthulhu um, and Knights Black Agents, which use the Gumshoe system, an investigative role-playing system. Um, and uh, several years ago, they released the Gumshoe one-to-one -one system, which is another specifically for two players. You have one which, GM and one which player. Which sounds uh, like a good idea. I mean, that's that's an yes. interesting setting and so on. I mean, I, I tried and, this and... game, actually. <laughs> Oh really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I like Gumshoe. I like Gumshoe uh, one to one. I think you're right that it, it makes sense as a product that uh, works really well for like a solo private investigator making their way for a story. And I wrote a, a original Gumshoe one to one uh, setting for them uh, called Alter Ego Mania, um, which is set in a world of uh, superheroes who are corrupt authority figures. Oh. Um, and you and you you play like a journalist who's investigating uh, their uh, allegations into their misconduct. Um, so it's a little bit like Lois Lane versus the boys kind of yeah. setup. Yeah, yeah, um, with, with less genitalia than the boys. I yes, assume. with less genitalia than the boys, exactly. Um, and it was uh, really fun to write, and uh, the team at Palgrim Press uh, were an absolute pleasure to write for. Uh, I was really happy with how it came out. Um, apparently sold very poorly, <laughs> which I feel so guilty about. <laughs> I feel so guilty that they uh, gave me this opportunity and apparently it hasn't found its and audience. And paid you so much, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I think you're right that, you know, it, it's a risk that the likes of UK Tin can take more easily, I think, than uh, some of the uh, larger publishers like Pearl Ring Press. Um by virtue of the fact that all the stuff that we're producing is kind of like small press, small zines, um, 
you know, large quantity of, of a variety of products uh, and then often sold in bulk in bundles or similar. We'll sell like, you know, three small bundles for X or three, uh, three big zines for Y. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it does make more sense for us to be making those risks. That, that's something I mean, that's really the strength of the, of the indie scenes that you, you can you can give sh have shots at a lot of different things. Mm. And it's a strength of the indie scene. And at the same time, I think sometimes in the indie scene, we fail to understand. I call those publishers major or boutique publishers, you know, the Modifuse, the Free League, the Pelgrin, mm. uh, the Magpie and so on. You know, they are, they are established publishers and I'm annoyed to no end when D&D fans call them indie or oh, a lot of people call them indie because they call indie anything that's not D&D but they, these are companies with a number of people on the payroll if not on the payroll freelancers they are really employed and so on and uh, failing at something taking a risk on something and the risk not paying out is a threat to the means of living of uh, of Michael or somebody else, so so there's a reason why it's not as uh, creative or risk taking. Not not it's not that it's not creative. It's that it's most more risk averse, but mm. for good reasons. And yeah, yeah, I, I I agree with that. That there are there are reasons that they aren't able to to take those big swings and and you know. I, I love those companies. I love those games. I love working for them. I don't want them to fail and, you know, uh, lose a lot of money. And I think you're right that these organizations, they're not indie, um, but on, on, on the other end of the spectrum, um, I know uh, that if you're... It's not a criticism. I, I don't course. say like they're not indie. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, no, no <laughs> there, there's now. something different with a different purpose, different strengths and different weaknesses. That... It, it is, and it is also different from the likes of Hasbro, right? There, yeah, there is a, yes. a, a meaningful distinction both from the, the mega corporations. They don't have shareholders. From... Like, literally, yes. they're not, they don't have shareholders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's very much its own thing. Um, with advantages and disadvantages, same as every other step of this uh, of this spectrum. But that's the thing which is important is to have this spectrum. And I, I mm. think uh, we we might lament that uh, TTRPG is not more widespread and reaching a wider audience and not more profitable. Uh, to some extent, I think it's a trend. I mean, it, it's great mm. if people can make a living out of it. That that's all I wish to to everyone. But I, uh, you know, to some extent, uh, I'm both. Uh, what's the word? Uh, yeah, I have negative feelings about what of the what some of the thing Asbro is attempting. On the other hand, I I find it very funny because I don't just don't see any way the math works. Yeah. Uh, it's not. It, it's, it's TTRPGs got bottlenecks of things like uh yeah either, either you need game master because you got a complexity and you sell those big books or you don't need the game master and so on it's gmless but then it's a it's a zine it's a small book so you cannot sell them at a high price or have splat books and so on so uh, at the end of the day i don't think you can scale up you know the consumption of those things without a number of, of, of factors so but it's great because that's what means that okay, sure, D and D's got this big, big place and it could be a bit smaller, like it was in other times, in other places. It wasn't always like that. Uh, but we have this spectrum. That's that's really the value of it. It's nice to have the D and D, and then under it, the Chaosium Modifius Free League, and under them, uh, in terms of volume, I'm speaking, uh, you got the Cubicle Seven and other people. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, it's a wide spectrum from the magpies, the pelguins, and so on, all the way to, uh, you know, uh, yeah, me alone on Nichio doing my first game and now trying to to do my second one. So, it's great. It is great. Like it, it you know, I, like you, I wish it was easier to just make a living in in TTRPGs, and that's a big part of what Tin is about, helping more people to be able to uh, do that um, in in whatever small way that we can help people. Um, but you know, I, very few people are becoming millionaires working in TTRPGs, and I think a big for, for a number of reasons. But I think a big reason is probably the best, most important, most exciting thing about TTRPGs is the imaginations of the people who play it, and you can't charge money for that. So that that's always going to be something that prevents it from becoming too profitable. But you know, great. 
the fact it's hard to make money keeps the assholes out. Exactly. But every yeah. time, every time I hear horror stories about people working in the video game industry, I'm like, wow, I'm really glad I don't work in an industry where yeah. you can make lots of money and people do that by ruining the lives of the people who work in it. Um, so obviously there's a balance. Um, yeah. But I, I, I don't want to. to lionize the sacrifice of the struggling artist or whatever you know i i do wish that there were more professional standards and and baseline expectations um for what a ttrpg should be able to expect working in this space um but it could be worse is i guess what i'm saying <laughs> and on that good word uh super circuit just made it to the stream welcome hey <laughs> Hi there. michael what's your final word we ending the stream i'm not even joking that's the end of <laughs> Time to end. I'm so uh, sorry, Super Circuit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, my final word is hi, Super Circuit. Uh, thanks again for joining me on this journey. Um, it's been wonderful uh, getting this far with the Kickstarter, and we've still got a few days left. And I'm so excited to see uh, what else we can achieve in these last few days, and then to produce the zine, produce the book, and get it into people's hands. Because you know, it's not real until people have had a chance to play it, and that's what I'm most excited about. Well, I sh wish you good luck with your first license game, Michael. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thanks, everyone. Go support me, The Singularity, uh, on crowdfunding. Uh, Super Circuit, you can catch this on YouTube. I should upload it uh, tonight already. It's uh, 9 p.m., so it's still manageable. And then it will be available in audio format uh, on the podcast feed. Oh, a dog. Uh, <laughs> yeah, not he's decided to join us. <laughs> uh, it will be available on the podcast feed as uh, audio. So, yeah, uh, please consider subscribing to the Twitch feed. Uh, I must say, uh, it's my second interview. It had been at least a year since I, I did some. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, interviewing you, I'm wondering, yeah, I should, maybe I should try to do a Zine Quest thing uh, yes. this year. Absolutely. Uh, but, uh, yeah, if I'm done with my first Kickstarter and I'm not disgusted with myself. By <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.